It was an invasion of my mind by a transcendently rational mind. It invaded my mind and assumed control of my motor centers and did my acting and thinking for me. But you had your own consciousness there as well. Yeah, but I was a spectator to it. Oh. I took the Minnesota multiphasic once, and was that a, a psychological profile test, mm -hmm. and I tested out as paranoid, cyclothymic, neurotic, uh, schizophrenic, and not only that, I tested out high on the K scale, which is the scale for lying. <laughs> I tested out as an, inc an incorrigible liar. And the person who was giving me the test was a friend of mine who was doing it for the Army as, a, as his career in the Army. And I was so high on some of the skills that I, the, the dot was up in the instructions part. <laughs> I couldn't even find the dot. And then he got to the K scale and he said, you're a malingerer. I says, you know, I says, I'm 4F. I, I, I don't have to malinger. I mean, I've got high blood pressure. I'm not, you're not, you're not in, a, you're, at this moment, you are not in a position of examining an inductee. So why would I malinger? Well, the case scale is consistency. They'll say, uh, I'll give you the question phrase several different ways. And they'd ask, um, answer yes, maybe, or no. Um, I think there is a divine deity that rules the world. And I'd say, yeah, there probably is. And then later on they'd say, um, I don't think there is a divine deity that rules the world. And I'd say, that's probably correct. <laughs> I can see a lot of reasons for believing that. So I'd mark yes, there is no divine deity. And then later they'd say, I'm not sure if there's a divine deity that rules the world. I'd say, yeah, that's about right. Uh, and, and now, uh, in every case I was sincere. Now, he couldn't believe that I was sincere. I used to kind of talk like I, I, I was really into acid, but the, the fact of the matter is I took acid two times. <laughs> <laughs> and the second time it was so weak a dose that it was uh, that I've smoked hash was stronger. I'm not, it may not even have been acid. <laughs> I only know of one time where I really took acid, that was Sandoz acid, and that was a giant horse capsule that I got from the University of California. Mm -hmm. And a friend and I split it. And I don't know, there must have been a whole milligram of it there. It was a gigantic thing, you know. We, we bought it for five dollars and took it home. And we looked at it for a while, we looked at it for a while, and we split it up. And took that, and it was just, it was the greatest thing, I'll tell you. It was, I went straight to hell, it was what happened. I found myself, <laughs> you know, the landscape froze over, and there were huge boulders, and there was a deep thumping, and it was, it was the day of wrath, and God was judging me as, as, a, as, a, as a sinner, and... <clears throat> This lasted for thousands of years, and it didn't get any better. <laughs> it just got worse and worse. And I was in terrible pain. I felt terrible physical pain, and I, all I could talk was in Latin. It was the most embarrassing, because the girl I was with thought I was doing it to annoy her. And I kept saying, Libera me domine in dia illa. You know, Agnes de Quito's Pecata Mundi, and their barma, a little German throwing their barma mix, my God. And especially uh, Trump, Tremens Factus Sum Ego et Timeo, et Timeo, I mean, I'm afraid. And I, you know, it's a Liberame Domine, and whining, whining like some poor dog that's been left out in the rain all night. And finally, just the girl with me said, Oh, barf and walked out of the room in disgust. And it, 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 was a, it was a little bit like when I rolled my VW. I mean, it was all very messy and, and, and strange. And the only good part of it was when I looked in the refrigerator um, 
And I had not defrosted the refrigerator for a long time, and there was nothing in the freezer compartment. I looked in, I saw this giant cavern of selectites and stalagmites. And I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I had finally become half crazed with horror and grief at the, at the state of the world. I was looking for some enlightenment. So, in 74, there came upon me at the trough of my life, at the point where I saw nothing but inexplicable suffering, there came to me the beatific vision, which calmed all my sense of horror at the world and my sense of the transcendent power of evil. And on the basis of this vision, we're speaking now of a time slightly over five years ago, just a bit over five years ago, I set out to write a book in which this was expressed in a, in a way that made rational sense rather than simply mystical sense that my mystical experience with the beatific vision had to be formulated in some rational structure that could be transferred to other people. What did this amount to philosophically? Um, my mental anguish was simply removed from me, you know, as if by a divine fiat, you know, that this, God... This just happened to you on your own? Yes. No one else in Yes, it just happened to me on my own. Um, it was as if the primordial curse or fall had lifted from me, you know, and that I was restored, healed. It was a sort of, you know, uh, intervention of a kind of a psychological mystical type, which I describe in Vallis, my new book. How, how, what is the title? Valis, V-A-L-I-S, it stands for Vast Active Living Intelligence System. Mm -hmm. What happened was that some transcendent divine power, which was not evil but was benign, intervened to restore my mind, to heal, heal my mind and heal my body and give me a sense of the beauty of the world, the joy of the world, the the sanity of the world. That the primordial creator deity, the way I, the way I express it, Vals, is the primordial creator deity was essentially deranged from our standpoint. That we are as humans a an evolution above the primordial deity. My outlook is based on, not on faith, but on an actual, that, the actual encounter that I had in 74 with a mysterious, powerful, rational mind, which was unfathomable to me as to what it was, to what it called itself. It seemed to resemble Ubik to, in many respects, Ubik the entity that I had written about in the novel by the title. When you say an encounter, was, was this um, a, a hallucination or a vision or something? It was an invasion of my mind mm. by a transcendently rational mind. It was almost as if I had been insane all my life, and suddenly I had become sane. Now, I've actually thought of that as, as a possibility, that I, that I actually have been psychotic until 1974, from 1928 when I was born until, 19, until March of 1974. But I don't think that's the case. I mean, I may have been somewhat whacked out, you know, and somewhat eccentric for years and years and years. But I wasn't all that crazy, because I'd been given Rorschach tests and so on. This was a rational mind that was not a human rational mind. It was, it was more like an artificial intelligence. 
Now, I don't pretend to know what it was. On Thursdays and Saturdays, I think it was God. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I think that it was extraterrestrials. Sometimes I think it was the Soviet Union, the Academy of Sciences was trying out their, their psych psychotronic microwave telepathic trans. I thought about that. I tried different theories, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I tried every theory. I thought of the Rosicrucians. I thought of the Russians. <laughs> I thought of extraterrestrials. I thought of God. I thought of Christ. Was it something you heard then, or, or was it more than that? Kind of well, it 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 <laughs> experience. Uh, it um, it invaded my mind and assumed control of my motor centers and did my acting and thinking for me. But you had your own consciousness there as well. Yeah, but I was a spectator to it. Oh. And it, it first of all, it said about healing me physically and my little boy, my little four-year-old boy had a birth undiagnosed birth defect, and this this mind which whose identity was totally obscure to me. I even thought it might have been Elijah, it might have been the Holy Spirit. I, I thought of everything. I, I, all I can say is I don't know, was that it was equipped with, with tremendous technical knowledge, engineering knowledge, medical knowledge, cosmo, cosmological knowledge, philosophical knowledge. Um, the first thing that it informed me was to be very wary of heavy metals. and. I've even thought that it was one of the great Illuminati of history, one of the great uh, Rosicrucians, like it might have been par Paracelsus. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought for a long time that it might have been Paracelsus. I thought it might be a previous incarnation of myself that had broken through. It had memories. It had memories dating back over 2,000 years. It spoke Greek. It spoke Hebrew. It spoke Sanskrit. There wasn't anything that it didn't seem to know. It uh, immediately set about putting my affairs in order. It fired my agent. It fired my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was very practical. It decided that the, the apartment had not been vacuumed adequately and not recently enough. It decided that I should stop drinking wine entirely because uh, of the sediment, and it turned out I had uh, abundance of uric acid in my system and switched me to beer. Um, it made elementary mistakes. It kept calling the dog he and the cat she, which annoyed my wife since I knew and she knew that the dog was a female and the cat was a male. It kept, re kept calling her ma'am, uh, and it would lapse into, into what turned out to be Koine Greek. Uh, when it would fall into a, co a contemplative state. Uh, she recognized it as Koine Greek because she'd taken some Attic Greek in, in, uh, in school. I didn't even recognize it as a language. I thought they were just, it was just nonsense. Uh, it was very intelligent and had a firm and shrewd grasp of business matters. It remarked into the, the, my typewriter's <laughs> margining. Um, I even thought it might have been the soul of, of my friend Jim Pike come back from the dead. And I'm, I don't exclude the possibility either, uh, Charles. I'm not willing to exclude the possibility that the Jim Pike came back to me as his son Jimmy came back to him, because it had a tremendous interest in early Christian theology and in Zoroastrianism, which Jim Pike had confessed to me once he believed was probably the true religion. It was very versed in Zoroastrianism and knew a great deal about the Essenes and the therapeutic. How did your wife perceive all this? Did you tell her what was going on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we discussed it. Um, she was impressed by the fact that because of the tremendous pressure that it put on, on people in my business that I made quite a lot of money very rapidly. We began to get checks in for thousands of dollars, money that was owed me, that this mind was conscious, existed in New York, and had never been coughed up. Uh, it also wrote a letter to the, Roman, to the Roman Catholic Church informing the Roman Catholic Church that my writing contained uh, allusions to the New Testament, which were to edify the Roman Catholic Church that a miracle had occurred. And it uh, it was very busy and active. Uh, does this interest you? <laughs> Put it okay. Uh, it had one overweening concern. 
This was in uh, March of 1974. It informed me that a group of conspirators had murdered the Kennedys, Dr. King, and Bishop Pike. That it, the mind that had taken me over, had seen the conspirators. The mind then graphically represented itself as the Kumean Sybil. Was the what? Kum the Sybil of Kume. Oh, I, I'm, my logical knowledge is not very good. Well, the Kumean Sybil was the Roman equivalent of the Delphic Sybil of Greece. Oh. It, uh, the Kumean Sybil advised the Roman Republic when it was in danger. She had the so-called Sibylline books which were consulted by the by Roman Republic. Uh, she well now I've let it out of the bag, haven't I? I said she it was female. Mm -hmm. She was female. She had the Sibylline books. She showed me the Sibylline books. She said the Republic was in danger. She meant the American Republic. She said that once again, the empire threatened to take over. She was there to see that the empire was destroyed. Hmm. I shouldn't be saying this. This is really stupid of me, Charles. I shouldn't be talking I'll about it. I'll cut that. out anything that you want me to No, say. I don't approve of that. I mean, if I'm indiscreet enough to say it, I don't necessarily want to sense, censor it. Well, wait a minute. I didn't see it that way. I see it as sometimes you need to think carefully as to what you want to make public and what you don't. And you can't think carefully at the same time that you're talking. Well, that's true. That's true. So I, I uh... Well, okay, mo most of it's in Vallis anyway. She said that the oscillation between the Republic and the Empire mm -hmm. was a constant in history. She caused me to see periods in history in which the empire had been defeated. It took me five years to identify one of those periods. It turned out to be the War of the Spanish Lowlands. It turned out to be the beginning of the 17th century in which the, the Dutch cities broke off from the Holy Roman Empire. She said that that was the situation now in the United States in 74 that the Republic was turning into an empire. Mm -hmm. And she said, and they shall be destroyed, mm -hmm. for they are murderers. Um, she then dictated a series of letters to Charles Wiggins. Yes. Charles Wiggins was on the House Judiciary Committee sitting in on the decision as to whether to impeach President Nixon. She said to inform she would dictate the letters. She dictated a series of letters to Congressman Wiggins. They dealt with constitutional law. I didn't understand the letters. Because they dealt with constitutional law and nothing about constitutional law. Later I found out that, that Congressman Wiggins is such an authority on constitutional law that he was suggested as a possibility for the Supreme Court. He came from Fullerton, which is where I was living, and it was his practice to read every letter that came from Fullerton and to answer it. She revealed to me that she had moved me to Fullerton from Canada so that I could write to Charles Wiggins on the Judiciary Committee while they were sitting in judgment on whether they should vote out a bill of impeachment on President Nixon. She dictated a series of letters informing Congressman Wiggins that he had no loyalty to the President of the United States because the President had violated his oath of office, which was that he would uphold the Constitution of the United States. He had failed to do so. Charles Wiggins did not owe the President any loyalty, citing historical examples. Congressman Wiggins answered each letter in detail, and then she sent the final letter. The letter contained the information of the Nixon transcripts were forgeries. They did not correspond to the Nixon to the tapes, and if the tapes were released, it would show that the transcripts were forgeries. 
That letter she sent to the um, Wall Street Journal, which had published an editorial saying that before the uh, transcripts showed that Nixon was innocent and that we should believe him when he said that they corresponded to the tapes. She stated that the transcripts were self-serving, were not evidentiary, and that the tapes would show that the forgeries, that the transcripts were forgeries, and at that point she wound down her mission. But by that time she had gotten me to the doctor, she had had me diagnosed, found a number of physical ailments that I had. My little boy had gone in for surgery and had his birth defect repaired, which was a life-threatening birth defect, it could have killed him at any time. She had everything but paper the wall for the apartment. Um, she told me about the article that would be coming out in Rolling Stone by Paul Williams. She told me that it would change my life. What was it? The, the article in Rolling Stone by Paul Williams about me. Oh, that one? Yeah. Well, she, she told me that would be coming out. My, she said your friend Paul, she showed me the article, yeah. said your friend Paul will be doing an article about your troubles in Marin County. Mm. Yeah, at that point, Paul hadn't said to me anything about it. She also said that she would stay on as my tutelary spirit. I had to look up tutelary and know what it meant. She had the unfortunate habit of lapsing into Greek. And then, having healed me, calmed me, she presented me with the beatific vision. She showed me a garden of such beauty that I could not believe it existed. And I walked around in it. I was actually in it. She transformed the landscape for me. Palm trees, beauty of its indescribable beauty, just indescribable beauty. And she said, when you get old and are dying, I will come back for you and take you there. But she said, I will not come back until then. She said, I got it. She says, I have to leave now. So, I don't know who she was. She appeared as Aphrodite at one point. Uh, <clears throat> at one time, I said, uh, Who are you? Who are you? Tell me who you are, for God's sake. Tell me who you are. And she said, think of me as Diana. Mm -hmm. She said, the, she said, for me, everything is permitted. She, Diana, I looked up Diana. She turns out she was the Roman patron, God, patroness of slaves. She was loved by the lower class. Um, in addition to all these things, she solved a problem facing me which was of such gravity that it probably was the greatest crisis of my life. Um, At that point, she described herself as, as a holy wisdom and applied the powers of holy wisdom to the problem. But at, at another time, she described herself as the spirit of Erasmus. Um, and finally, she said that she was essentially playing a game, that she loved to play games, and that none of the things she had described about herself, her identity were, were correct, that, that, she, that I would never know who she was. But she, 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 I heard the beautiful bells in the distance and, and whenever, the most beautiful bell. But she finally said that, she, that I would never know who she was. Hmm. But is Venice then a novel or, or a mixture? It's a mixture of autobiography, fiction, hmm. and dramatic devices from the uh, modern theater, from Carandello and uh, Barry. Well, that's good enough to read it. I don't pretend to know who she was. Uh, she said conflicting things. Uh, I have 
I spend between four and eight hours a day doing research in, in history to find where anybody's had an experience like this. I can't find an example. Um, I just keep seeing you as, as being uh, a natural focus for some strange new religions. She, uh, at one point I was convinced that I was dealing with a computer. I said, would you tell me where you, I said, all right, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll make a deal, will you tell me where you are? She said, I'm in the Portuguese states of America. I said, there are no Portuguese states of America. But she, she was able to solve intricate problems that I was facing. She, she loved puzzles. She still loves puzzles. She loves puzzles. And she, she was fascinated by a puzzle. A uh, crisis for me was a serious crisis. It was a puzzle involving my anti-war activities and my political affiliations. Uh, she saw in it, I think, a chance to solve a puzzle that was a Chinese finger trap. The harder you tried to solve it, the mm. further away you got. And she saw an opportunity to. That I, I'm, I'm really convinced that her love of puzzles was was just too much. She couldn't resist. I'm reminded suddenly of that that um, well series of events in We Can Build You, where Mr. Lincoln keeps. So. so I had to write a book about this, and I just construed her as the as a rational mind mm. breaking into mm. the irrational universe. So I call her vast, active, living intelligence, mm. which is a description, a simple description. She's vast, active, living intelligence. She's an organized system. Mm. And uh, do you recognize the possibility, however remote? That, that you could have in some way been talking to yourself, that in, in some way you could have known everything that she knew. Yes. It could have been a dialogue between the two hemispheres of my brain, as we find in Scanner Darkly. Mm -hmm. There was my right hemisphere. It could have been a, a, a second uh, ecosystem, a second self-system in my head. But you prefer not to believe that? Um, This was suggested to me by at least one person. Mm -hmm. And certainly Scanner, which had already been written, yeah. I had already written Scanner, although I hadn't published it, suggests that I have two psychoi, two psyches in my mm -hmm. one, one in each, each hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And the right hemisphere personality broke through. Mm -hmm. And it's the anima in Jungian terms, my anima and anima. Yeah. Yeah. But there's only one thing that, that, that there's one thing that, that happened which, which when I think that when when I think to myself I have another personality in me and that was it is that um, she interfered with a sequence of causal of causal events mm -hmm. in, in my environment mm -hmm. she was actually present as an extra or appeared present appeared present now she may not have been. It may have been a projection uh, from my own mind onto, onto my reality, onto my environment. But I mean, the cases that I've read of, of multiple personalities have been from that. Well, I, I think it's a good possibility. The, the only thing is that she was armed with ferocious knowledge. That, that of course, is, is the part which is so fascinating. She, she, and she was, I mean, she was so shrewd. And she continued to, she had, she had first spoken to me in high school uh, it, during a physics test in the 11th grade. I wasn't able to solve any of the, uh, of the 10 questions eight dealt with or based on Archimedes principle. And I didn't know the principle, so I couldn't solve the eight questions mm -hmm. of the 10. And all of a sudden, uh, her voice cut in and she said, and she, defined our, she, she explained Archimedes principle. She explained the principle in theory, and then she showed the application to each one of the eight questions. And I said, well, now I'll test this out and see if there's anything to this by, by examining the grades that I got. And of the ten questions, one was wrong, and it was one of the first two, yeah. which I had done. And all eight that she had done were correct. And I got an A on the test and an A on the question. Are you now saying then that this is 
a voice which has broken through to you over the years? Just two times before oh, then, and once in the 60s. And also she had put a great deal of material in my novel, which she was very proud of. She was not reticent about that. <laughs> she drew my attention to material. She had put in Ubik, Flow My Tears, Faith of Our Fathers. You know, there is nothing that I like better than, than to have my worldview uh, shaken up. She said to me, the last thing she said to me was last week. Said to me, she, for the first time she used the word I, speaking of herself, she said, I make moves which you cannot understand. And I knew, you know, that, that she would always elude me, mm -hmm. and that she knew she would always elude me, and she knew I would always try to understand her. Did she tell you anything about talking about this? She told me two things never to tell. Oh. <laughs> So I, I inferred from that that I was, it was all right to tell the rest. Uh, no, I just wondered if she sort of said, when someone turns up with a tape recorder, <laughs> do this. She told me two things. Huh? So, and I, as I say, I just inferred it was all right. I, I'm, I'm quite reticent mm. about this. I do not. I've talked to my priest about it. Mm. And I've talked to a couple of my close friends, and of course my ex-wife. And um, several people that I correspond with, I've, I've discussed it. And I tried to discuss it with Ursula Le Guin, and she just wrote and said, I, I think you're crazy. And sent back the, 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 the material. I, I sent her some material. She mailed it back to me and said, I think you're crazy. So that, that of course, you know, I didn't tend yeah. to discuss it very much. But yeah. uh, when Ballas comes out, you know, a lot of it's going to be in Ballas. Yeah. So I'm less reticent than I was. But uh, this is five, we're talking about five years, and we're talking about an entity which had spoken to me in, in high school in the 60s, and who also has saturated my writing with, with uh, pre-Socratic philosophy. I remember in 74 I was being interviewed by a French guy who was doing his dissertation for the French you know, PhD, and he asked me about the Empedoclean philosophy in the Ubik, and I said I had never read Empedocles, and he got so angry that he, although he'd flown all the way from France to interview me, he got up and left. He said, you're a liar. He said, you've got whole sections of Empedocles. And I later read, read Empedocles, and he was correct. But she was an authority on, on Greek philosophy. That was her speciality. She loved that, all the, the uh, Heraclitus and um, Xenophanes and Parmenides. She loved the paradoxes of Zeno, but she disapproved of his arguing any point. She disapproved of the sophists. She highly disapproved of the sophists. But she showed me the Sibylline books. They were really something. In the Sibylline books was listed the entire history of human civilization. She didn't show me all. Oh my God, <laughs> she just showed me passages here and there. Mm, I have more than I can cope with. Oh dear, <laughs> I, I wrecked your whole trip to Calvin. No, 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 you've enriched it. 